Hello, um, my name is Sam Law. Uh, I'm an organizer with Shale Shock. Um, I'm also a Tompkins County native, born and raised. Um, and so today, uh, the point of this presentation is going to be to give everyone a little bit of background about the current state of the repowering proposal and uh, this, the choice between uh, in front of the Public Service Commission to either repower the plant with natural gas or to um, have uh, cost-effective transmission upgrades. Um, part of this presentation is going to be to help people write public comments. So I, I apologize, but I'm going to use a PowerPoint. Um, not because I want everyone to read every word, but because afterwards the entire presentation will be on, like, online in a written form that people can go on and look at. Um, but it is kind of a word-heavy PowerPoint that is unfortunate. Um, We'll, uh, we'll also touch a little bit, uh, Jennifer Tuttle's here from the Sierra Club, and we're after the sort of bulk of the presentation, which is going to be on um, sort of the case against uh, repowering with natural gas, um, and how we can submit comments to the Public Service Commission about that, we'll talk about Lansing, and sort of, there's been a lot of misinformation, because the, the only person who's been really promoting uh, the repowering locally or talking about this issue has been the plant manager from AES Cayuga. So he's kind of very effectively spun the debate and there's, I think, a lot of misinformation, a lot of people who haven't actually looked at the like specifics of the economics. So we can get into that. And then after this whole presentation, there'll be an, uh, an opportunity for some question and answer. Um, we can eat refresh, drink, drink and eat some refreshments in there. Um, and we have papers and pens if people are so inspired to actually start writing public comments tonight, although you can definitely go home and wait till August 16th when that's going to. Um, so, name of the presentation, Repowering Cuga versus Transmission Upgrades. Um, so, a quick history of the plant. It opened in 1955. Um, it's a 13, uh, 313 megawatt uh, power plant. It has two coal-fired turbines. Um, in the 90s, it was sold from NYSEG to the AES Corporation, which is um, an international uh, energy corporation. Um, in 2011, they went bankrupt, and then they went through their books and realized that this plant was just really not profitable with the sort of energy future that existed. And at that point, they decided to share it to their bond, sell it to their bondholders. Um, so their bondholders formed upstate New York power producers, and then they formed another company that actually owns the plant, that they're all the same people, called Cuga Operator Company, LLC. Um, and so that's who owns the plant right now. Um, on July 20th of last year, uh, 2012, the Cuga Operating Company uh, announced that it intends to mothball the plant, to close the plant. Um, and they announced this to the Public Service Commission, um, and they cited the fact that the cost of burning coal on in today's energy market, it's just not economically viable. The cost has gone up as coal deposits have been depleted and as other sources of energy have come online, uh, coal is no longer competitive. So a brief aside, um, like I mentioned earlier, these, the, this coal plant's been in the community a long time and has really successfully sold coal to the community. So I think there's sort of this misapprehension in our community that coal, this coal plant is somehow safe. They, in the 90s, installed scrubbers, which did effectively nothing, but they talked a lot about it. So just some quick statistics, just so people can have on their mind that it's a good thing that this plant is closing. Um, out of the past 12 quarters, it spent three in non-compliance with the Clean Air Act, and 10 quarters in non-compliance with the Clean Water Act. Um, according to the Clean Air Task Force, the Cuga power plant is responsible for five deaths, nine heart attacks, and 78 asthma attacks a year. Um, a recent report by Earth Justice um, found that contaminated leachate and runoff from an on-site coal waste uh, landfill discharged directly into a pond into Cayuga Lake. Um, and the contaminated discharge contained grossly elevated levels of arsenic, cadmium, and selenium. Um, in addition, a partially unlined landfill contaminated groundwater and residential wells with elevated levels of lead. Um, it continues to get worse. Uh, they, in 2011, they released uh, 218,594 pounds of toxic emissions, and um, they receive all their coal from northern Appalachia, where it is mined through 
mountaintop removal, which if you don't know about mountaintop removal, it involves blowing the tops off mountains, filling valleys, uh, blocking streams, and um, it's, it's got a huge public health effect, a huge environmental effect, um, and so it's, it's a pretty extreme form of extraction, um, and is, is actually killing people in Appalachia. So um, the fact that we're able to take this coal plant offline is really wonderful, and it's a really great opportunity. And that none of this talks about the fact that coal, of course, is burning coal creates carbon dioxide, which is a potent greenhouse gas. So returning to this uh, repowering, um, here's a quick timeline of the proceedings. So as I mentioned, um, in, on July 20th, 2012, the Cuga Operating Company filed with the Public Service Commission um, to indefinitely mothball the plant, which is to just close it. They can't close it right away because that would cause problems. Um, and they said that's because forecasted electricity prices um, are so, so low that the plant is no longer economically feasible. Um, on December 17th, uh, the Public Service Commission approves a reliability support services agreement between Cuyuga Operating Company and NYSEG, under which NYSEG ratepayers, so everyone who pays money to NYSEG, is paying $30 million a year. Um, so if you look at your NYSEG bill, there's going to be this reliability charge, and that's what this is, um, to keep the plant open, because it's just not economically viable at this point. Um, so they're, you know, this is a private corporation that's using the public's money to keep it open um, at the moment. Um, so on January 18th, uh, stemming from Governor Cuomo's October 2012 Energy Highway Task Force blueprint, the Public Service Commission initiates a separate proceeding to determine the best long-term solution for Cuga and Dunkirk plants. So the Dunkirk plant is another coal plant that is being taken offline, and they're also dealing with the same option to upgrade transmission lines or to repower with natural gas. Um, on February 19th uh, of this year, NYSEG submits the transmission proposal, so the sort of well-articulated what it would mean to upgrade transmission lines. And on March 26th, uh, Cayuga submitted its repowering proposal um, with natural gas. There are four options. Um, on May 17th, NYSEG submits uh, its final report to the Public Service Commission recommending transmission reinforcements uh, because those options provide, quote, the most certainty to customers with regard to um, cost, schedule, and operational risk. Um, so NYSEG, examining the impacts on ratepayers, what they know about the New York State energy market, decided that repowering this plant, is just, it just doesn't make sense. Um, and they, of course, have been supported by the Sierra Club and a coalition of other environmental groups like Environmental Advocates of New York, some other ones, as well as the Business Council of New York, because this is, this is one of these rare opportunities as environmentalists where we find ourselves really the economic argument to not repower this plant and the environmental argument really line up on this one. Um, and so on Gen this not this Monday, but the next Monday, January 29th, there's going to be a public hearing about this um, in Lansing. Um, when Dunkirk had their public hearing, uh, 2,000 people showed up. So it's going to be really important that we continue to pack this and, you know, you need to come, you need to get everyone you know to come to this hearing. Um, and if you want to speak, you should um, plan on arriving a bit early so you can sign up and beat the, you know, 1,999 other people. Um, so yeah, and that's, that's 6 Ludlowville Road in Lansing, New York at the um, Lansing Middle School Auditorium. And then finally, the deadline for public comments has been extended um, to August 16th. So everyone can submit public comments by then. Um, and the Public Service Commission really will take comments that people write pretty seriously, especially if you include, um, you know, if, if your comments aren't just, uh, well, we'll talk about how to submit good comments. Um, so the, the, the sort of, the, the solutions that are faced, that the Public Service Commission has given us, okay? So these, this is what they have given our, this is our choice. This is why it's not, you know, repowering the plant with natural gas or everyone installing solar panels on their home and us living in a totally carbon-free future. Um, one is the transmission upgrades, um, where these two, uh, 
one would be building a new transmission line and then upgrading another uh, substation. So these two pretty like cost effective. They've actually not released the prices specifically, but um, we know that they're significantly less than the second option, which is repowering. There are four options, the cheapest of which um, is around $60 million, and the most expensive of which, which is the one that they're really advocating for, is uh, $370 million. And this, this would be paid for um, mostly by uh, rate hikes to nice egg rate payers. So the, what's really important now is that we submit public comments. So in this next section, I've kind of given you all a background on the plant, and we're going to move into sort of what one would want to include in their public comments. Um, the Public Service Commission really wants to hear from people who have a clear stake in the decision, who are really impacted by the decision. So NYSEG ratepayers, um, landowners, local residents, all people who would be affected by this decision. Um, and so I'm sure everyone in this room probably falls into one of those categories. And it's really important to, you know, when you start your letter, explain why this, you're not just a random person, but you're someone who cares a lot about the outcome of this decision and someone who the, the um, Public Service Commission can take seriously. Um, they want comments that are specifically about the question before them. So um, many of us obviously are really opposed to any sort of natural gas development, um, and that's something we can include in our letters. We also might you know, think that maybe converting the plant to run on biomass or doing other things might be a good idea, but that's just not the options that are before us. The, what you have to limit your comments to is repairing the Cuga plant with natural gas or pursuing transmission upgrades. Other things can be mentioned in this, uh, in your comments, um, but you just have to tie it clearly into this choice. Um, so if you want to talk about natural gas, you can talk about how the plant, repowering the plant is going to increase demand and as someone who's concerned about uh, the impacts of natural gas development on this region, you're really opposed to it for that reason, but you also want to include other reasons. Um, the Sierra Club uh, really thinks that the best arguments we have are our economic arguments. So really you want to include a very strong um, argument that as a rate payer you don't want this, um, if you are a rate payer, because it's, it's going to mean rate hikes, and it's going to just be adverse, it's gonna adversely affect the local economy. You know, we're already paying uh, $30 million a year, uh, we'd have to pay up to $370 million a year, that would all be removed from the economy. Uh, the effects of that would be pretty large. Um, you can also, if you're really annoyed that you have to do these two options, you can mention that you're not pleased by the fact that it's limited to these two options. So that's sort of your like one out, out thing. You can just have a sentence in there like, I really feel like this, this should have been expanded to include renewable energy as a third choice. Um, so, straight to the economic argument. I've already mentioned the $30 million a year that ratepayers are paying in addition. So, that, that's something everyone's paying. Uh, also, up to the $370 million. That's the second part of the economic argument. So, both of those um, are really expensive for ratepayers, and as, as we'll kind of get into, this, this plant isn't needed. We have enough energy um, in New York State that if we just increase the transmission up, up, if we just do the transmission upgrades, which are going to be cheaper, um, and these transmission upgrades will have to happen eventually as well. That's something that NYSEG and uh, NISO uh, both, both said. Um, so really, there's, there's really no argument for keeping this plant open other than maybe like the, the economic effects on the local the, the effects on the local economy, which we can discuss later, I think they've been much overplayed. Um, and if you're maybe Jerry Goodenow, who's the uh, operating officer of the plant, you might really be worried about your paycheck um, if the plant closes. But um, I think we can not worry about, you know, keeping the extractive industry's um, profits up. Uh, I think we, we have other priorities. Um, so finally, just about this plant, the economic viability of the plant depends on a low price of natural gas. So in their report, NYSEG, um, I have the quote here, but basically NYSEG said that the estimates the Cuga power plant used in their proposal um, 
don't make sense, that this assumes a very low price of natural gas, and that um, that price you know, can fluctuate wildly from if we manage to uh, keep fracking at bay and ban it in other states, that might rise, raise the price of gas, and so even if we had this power plant, it would suddenly become no longer economically feasible. Or um, another case is if um, the export terminals, which are proposed along the East Coast, are built, um, the price of gas will become linked to international markets and the price will skyrocket and this plant will again become economically in, uh, infeasible. So, um, like the, the logic of this plant being something that's going to make money is, is also be in, called in question by NYSEG. So, you know, not uh, me with shale shock, but with, you know, the New York State, uh, with, with the, our utility company. Um, the plant is also going to require more infrastructure. So there'll be an 18 mile pipeline built to connect with the Dominion pipeline in Freeville, um, all seized via eminent domain going through sensitive ecological habitat. Um, so I think that that project should alarm us. Um, there's already a lot of infrastructure going in in New York um, and we need to really stop the natural gas infrastructure. Um, but you know, when you're talking to the Public Service Commission, you can mention that you're opposed to this project. Um, you know, landowners might not want to uh, like the idea of eminent domain being used to get the right of way for the pipeline. Um, also, the pipeline, uh, increasing the demand for natural gas in this region is going to increase demand for other pipeline expansion projects. So um, Bill Houston's here, and he's been working on the uh, proposed expansion of, I think, the Millennium and um, the Constitution pipelines, which are um, going to be going in like along I-81 and some other places around here. These, this is taking you know, smaller pipelines and expanding them significantly to um, basically prepare this region for fracking. Um, and they're, they're not waiting for fracking to, uh, you know, for Cuomo to make a decision. They're, they're just moving forward with their projects. Um, and we don't want to give them another reason that we need these pipelines. Um, and finally, uh, and I think you know, this is a, a kind of an obvious point, but um, the need for low, low cost of natural gas if this plant was built would mean that there, our, our area would suddenly have this strange um, incentive for natural gas drilling to happen that we don't need. Um, we don't need to be powering our homes with fracked gas from Pennsylvania. Um, you know, six people died last Tuesday in an explosion at a gas well in West Virginia. I think that we can find more humane sources of energy. Um, I'm sure people know all about the uh, adverse effects of fracking, so I will say no more. So who's going to be impacted by this? Um, landowners, as I mentioned, the right of way for the pipelines being seized by eminent domain. NYSEG ratepayers will be impacted through the rate hikes that have already been discussed. Um, workers, so one thing that's been really hyped in you know, the Ithaca Journal, um, Jerry's consistently been talking about it when he gives presentations is the jobs. Um, and I think, so one thing is in Dunkirk, New York, when, they, when National Grid, which is like their equivalent of NYSEG, analyzed the repowering option, they found that the, the loss of jobs due to rate hikes would actually exceed the number of jobs created at the plant. So we don't actually have the specific data for um, our area, but we can imagine it's roughly similar. Um, and I think we're going to be looking in over the next couple of weeks on how to find that data and make that argument more um, specific for our area. But so that's, that's one, one thing. So while there might be you know, a couple of people hired at this plant or maybe you know, 50 or 60 people, um, there'll be a lot of other jobs lost. Also, when they give numbers for the number of people hired, they often talk about, they give numbers in the 100s because they talk about um, the people who will be hired to construct the pipelines, but those are of course temporary jobs and having you know, suddenly a huge demand for workers who, that are not going to be demanded in the future creates you know, strange ripples in the economy just not good for a sort of sustainable, um, just economy. Um, also, gas-fired power plants like these are extremely dangerous and there's a risk of explosion. And um, in 2010, a plant very similar to the one being proposed exploded, killed six workers and injured 50 other people. So, you know, this is not, you know, a safe, clean burning natural gas plant. This is a very dangerous piece of infrastructure that would be put in our county. Um, 
and you know, we asked the um, uh, Lansing Fire Department whether they thought about how they would you know, respond like, to having this new, uh, potentially very explosive plant, and they, they hadn't thought about it at all. So um, you know, when, when we're thinking about cost to Lansing, there might be costs that are further down the road that we haven't thought of that um, are not being discussed at the moment. And then finally, frontline communities, um, people who are living in fracked regions, if the repowering goes through, will experience more demand for fracking. And um, public health risks, groundwater contamination, industrialization, destruction of agricultural ways of life. Um, so that's, that's all really something we don't want to burden people just you know, 50 miles south in Pennsylvania, people in West Virginia, people in the Dakotas. We don't want fracking to happen. And we also don't want to give any reason for fracking to happen in New York. Um, this is a picture just of the explosion. So you get an idea, it's, it's a huge explosion. The entire factory is kind of destroyed um, there. So this is really unsafe. Um, and th when this Connecticut explosion happened, it made international news, um, similar to the uh, train derailment recently in Canada. Um, it, was, it was a big story. Um, then there's the effect on climate. So when Jerry's been going around giving his presentation, he's the, which, you know, the Cuga power plant, they've been saying, you know, clean burning natural gas, it's better for the climate. This is a sort of myth that has been created similar to the myth of clean coal. Um, so people are probably familiar with the study by Anthony and Graffia and Tony uh, and um, Bob Howarth at Cornell that when you consider the life cycle effects of burning natural gas from, you know, the truck traffic required, the amount of leakage from pipes, um, the emissions for, of carbon dioxide once the methane is actually burned, uh, that the effects of natural gas are actually worse than coal, especially when you consider the 20 year, uh, the, the next 20 years out, because methane degrades after about 20 years. But in the short term, it's actually a much more potent greenhouse gas lake. Um, so permanently, stopping burning fossil fuels on Cuga Lake would really significantly help us reach, uh, I mean, maybe, I don't know, it would, it would be a significant for Tompkins County to help us reach regional uh, greenhouse gas emission goals, okay? So um, there's a slew of different uh, legislative efforts that have tried to talk about everything from, you know, the, the Tikpee communities, um, and the ICLE communities, which are just sort of local people passing resolutions saying they want greenhouse gas emissions, to more serious things like ex Cuomo's Executive Order 24, his uh, 2013 State of the State Address, and the New York State Energy Highway task. Uh, um, so those, those things are, um, talk about transitioning off fossil fuels, and that's really, um, when you talk about climate change to the Public Service Commission, mentioning these uh, different sort of legislative efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions will go towards making your comments sound um, much more like serious. And not, you know, you're not just someone who's like randomly throwing climate change in, but you're actually talking about goals that they're tasked with paying attention to. Um, also, transmission upgrades will make it easier to add renewables to the grid. Um, so right now, this power plant is really only needed during peak hours, like on days like today when everyone's got their, you know, air conditioners running and the Auburn plant is burning, is doing, there's a plant in Auburn that uses a lot of electricity. Um, so when, when everything on the grid is on, going at full blast, it's needed. Um, so that's when it's needed. But if we had transmission upgrades, we could add renewables to the grid locally. Um, and then on days when we really need a lot of energy, we can bring it in from outside. Um, and of course, transmission upgrades would also mean that we're bringing in energy from outside the entire time. Um, and so contrary to the claims that if we don't burn the fossil fuels here, uh, we'd be receiving them from out-of-state fossil fuel plants, um, which is, I mean, it's kind of ridiculous to be arguing that, you know, it's going to be burnt anyway. We just need to stop burning fossil fuels. But um, the energy, uh, according to Jennifer the other day, will actually likely come from wind farms. So um, there are you know, adverse environmental effects of wind projects, but um, at the same time, it's not burning fossil fuels. It's not uh, sort of adding to the climate crisis that we are currently experiencing. So uh, solutions. So the solution that we're really advocating for is a transmission upgrade. Um, and that's an immediate solution. 
But we can't just have the, the immediate solution. So we need to be thinking about how to provide a just transition for the town of Lansing. So I know um, legislators like Carol Chalk and um, Barbara Lipton are looking into ways to um, provide uh, a just transition for Lansing. There are funds available that Jennifer is going to talk about um, to actually replace the lost tax base. Um, so this is not a situation where you know, we have to keep this plant or the you know, small amount of money they've sort of finagled their way into paying instead of paying taxes uh, is lost. Um, secondly, uh, when we take this power plant offline, um, there's, we don't need this energy. There's currently a, a surplus of energy in New York. Um, so what, what the problem in New York is, is really just problems from getting the surplus from where it's being burned to where, or you know, winded or whatever, however this energy is being created to customers. So the transmission upgrades would, you know, basically take the surplus on the market and allow it to be used here instead of just doing whatever electricity does when it's not being used. Um, so we really don't need this plant. There's no, repowering this plant, there's no like demand that's not going to be met if we don't repower this plant. Um, the New York State Energy Highway Plan, which I mentioned before, has $5.7 billion scheduled for the development of clean renewable energy resources. Um, so that's the kind of development we need locally. Um, and I think people should really be thinking about advocating for that um, instead of, you know, continuing a like a toxic and deadly legacy of uh, fossil fuels. Um, I think we can move beyond that. And to sort of support the fact that we can move beyond that, there's the study released by uh, Stanford professor Mark Jacobson and uh, Howarth and, and Graffia, Jeanette Barth, names that are probably familiar to a lot of people, that um, it's possible to, rem to move New York State to totally clean and renewable energies by 2050 and that we can be at 85% of this goal by 2030. Um, and, you know, Mark Jacobson actually submitted a statement um, in support of shutting the plant. He said, you know, what we need to be doing is taking plants like these offline, not adding plants, um, specifically talking about the Cayuga plant. So, you know, there are a lot of people who are thinking really hard about the ways we can transition, and none of them are saying we need natural gas here. Um, so, you know, when they try and greenwash this plant and say that it's, you know, better for the climate, that's just not what people who are studying this and seriously have a stake in uh, combating climate change are saying. So um, this is where you can mail your comments to uh, and you can also email your comments here. There's also a shorter comment thing you can do online. Um, so I just want to, before I end, just talk a little bit about Lansing. Um, this is just one slide I'm going to talk about. So instead of paying taxes, the Lansing, the, the power plant has negotiated payment in lieu of taxes to the, to the Lansing Central School District. Um, and so in 2003, you can see it's a little bit over a million uh, $3 million. Um, and in 2013, this year, it was um, a little bit under $2 million. And it's, it's actually a 53% reduction that's happened um, since 2003. And they only now pay 6.5% of the Lansing uh, City School District, uh, Central School District's budget. So we're not talking about a dramatic reduction, they've already lost this amount of money, and I, I'm not actually advocating that we defund schools or do anything like that. I think it's a, a really serious problem that needs to be addressed, and I think there are ways that we can provide Lansing's taxes in the interim uh, while they sort of rebuild their local economy after losing this big plant. Um, but it's not, it's not this like catastrophic chunk of change. It's actually like relatively small. Now also if you look at the payments that they're making, they've just been going down every year, um, except for 2007, I guess, and 2006, but pretty clear downward slope. Um, so projected out 2014 uh, and 2015, it's going to continue to go down. This is just with the coal plant being burnt, uh, burning using the ratepayer money. Um, but with conversion, um, I think there's some pretty good reasons to believe that the plant is going to be making less money than it is now. Um, one of those reasons is natural gas turbines fire, fire up and fire down really quickly. So with a coal plant, you have to turn it on like 12 hours in advance before you need the power. With a natural gas turbine, you're going to turn it on like 20 minutes before. And what that means is that the amount that they're going to be producing electricity-wise is a lot less than the plant's producing now. So, you know, it might be more profitable in some ways, but it's, it's not 
uh, because it's you know not burning this really expensive coal, um, but it's also you know not really something that we can hedge our bets on and say Lansing is you know really needs this. And I think another thing to point out is you know they are not able to pay their taxes right now at their fully assessed value. So why should we trust them going on into the future um, when they convert to being able to pay like taxes? I think that having really manipulative uh, sort of extractive industries in our area, that's not people we need to be paying our taxes. We can find local sources of power, other forms of development that can replace that. Um, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Jennifer who's gonna talk a little bit more about this just transition piece. And then after that, we'll have some question and answers um, where I think I'll welcome other people who've been uh, part of the group that put this together to come up as well to, to field questions because there might be some answers that I don't know. So. Well, thank you everyone for having me here tonight and thank you Sam for giving this great presentation and helping to organize this event. Um, most of you don't know me, so just give me a second to introduce myself. My name is Jennifer Tuttle and I'm with the Sierra Club. Um, the Sierra Club has recently launched what's called the Beyond Coal Campaign, and it is a nationwide effort to get us off, really get us off fossil fuels of all types. But we're, there's a natural gas campaign as well, there's an oil campaign, and I'm working on the coal campaign. So our goal is to help communities successfully transition from damaging fossil fuels to a clean energy future. In New York State, we have four remaining utility scale plants that we're looking at to help transition out. Um, the Dunkirk and the Cayuga plant, and they are being talked about right now not because of the Sierra Club initiative, but because of the Energy Highway initiative and the PSC decided it's time to have this docket. So I just wanted to be clear up front about why these two plants are the ones we've been focusing on lately. There's also a plant in Somerset, which is in Niagara County, and there's one in a very populated area in Tonawanda, it's the Huntley plant. Um, in addition to looking towards helping these plants retire and transition, we're also talking about bringing 9,000 megawatts of clean renewable energy online in a very short period of time. And when you're talking about bringing clean renewable energy online, you're also talking about a lot of manufacturing potential that can come to upstate communities. So one wind turbine has 8,000 component parts, and even if we can get part of that manufactured in upstate New York, we're gonna be doing a lot better than we're doing now. Um, so something that I think there's a lot of unfair and false choices presented in the energy conversation, whatever type of energy you're talking about. You know, we have this false choice between utility scale power and distributed power. We have choices between extraction communities and consumer communities. And right now I think we're being presented with sort of a false choice between this jobs and this tax issue versus clean, safe energy. And I think it's important to note up front that the Sierra Club is not an economic development agency nor are we a labor union, so we are not experts in all of these matters. What we have done is work with folks across the country who are dealing with very similar issues to try to figure out what makes sense for the community and to give them as really helpful examples to have people begin this conversation together. Because it's not your job to come up with the perfect economic transition plan, it's our elected representative's job to do that. That's why we have folks who represent us in Albany and at the local and state level, and the national level. So some things that we've done are look at different sources of money that can help pay for both the pilot payments and also to help workers who are going to be transitioned out one way or the other. And it is very important to note that regardless of which, which option is chosen, there are people at the plant who are going to lose their jobs. So IBEW and other people have to be thinking about what happens to these workers regardless of which, uh, which path that, that NYSEG and um, PSC decide to go down. So, we have identified some money that can be available through regional economic development councils, through the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, and through the Green Jobs Green New York program, that we can successfully use that money if it's tied to a permanent retirement of the plant. And to be clear, we're not talking about closing the plant down tomorrow. And the current RSSA or RMR, depending on what you want to call it, is scheduled to go through 2014, but it is most likely going to be extended to 2014, or to 2017, excuse me, regardless of which option the plant goes down. So there is still three years of this plant operating where we have folks in their current capacities. It's not an overnight transition. So we are talking with folks um, at the state level about what makes sense for this community. Where do you want to see this money come from? 
And we are looking for folks in this room to give us ideas, and we're also looking for our elected leaders to come together with representatives from organized labor and from economic development councils to actually sit down and help us figure out how do we successfully make this transition happen. Um, and I think that there's definitely ways that we can do it. There's examples in Massachusetts of this happening through the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. That is not necessarily the best pot of money because we really want a lot of that money going towards renewable energy investment. But it is an example of a way to do it along with other programs through the workforce redevelopment money um, and Green Jobs Green New York. So there's just a few examples of how we're doing it. But it is really important to understand that though the PSC has us deciding this issue on very narrow terms and we have to keep it within their scope just because that's how this administrative body works, that we are still being presented with a false choice. So we want to make these arguments and then really come together as a community to advocate for these clean renewable energy investments that are going to help all of us. And that's something that the Sierra Club's been working aggressively with, with unions and workers across the country, and we hope to do so right here in Tompkins County. And I think questions now?